Um, my name is Vijay Kumar, and that's Tony Feldblower and my colleague Manu Alexander. Um, we are surgeons who work in the community. <clears throat> and uh, in line with the recent changes in the NHS in relation to the five year forward plan, to the vanguard sides, uh, etc., we sometimes feel the government is actually. Uh, reinventing the wheel some ways, uh, hopefully for the better, because uh, many of us who have trained in the 90s and 80s and the early 2000s know about the multiple community centers where surgery actually takes place. But what's interesting is uh, the ASPC, which is a part of the ASGBI, which is Association of Surgeons and Primary Care, consists of uh, uh, GPs with special interest, uh, people, uh, consultants who are moved out of working in the hospital. Uh, to work in the community with a large amount of work that's taking place in the community now. Uh, certainly where I come from in the uh, northern part of England, in, in West Yorkshire and South Yorkshire, a lot of work happens in the community. We have consultants who would choose to drop their sessions in secondary care, work part-time in the hospital, work part-time in the community, and they tend to do a considerable amount of work. For example, I can tell you in the Wakefield area, uh, literally 100% of the non-two weeks wait to list endoscopy takes place in the community. Uh, your orthopedic surgeon, uh, literally all the day case surgery that used to traditionally happen uh, in the hospitals has moved out into the community. <clears throat> so there's a big push for uh, consultants and GPSIs and others to work in the community. And we are here to, to represent uh, those consultants and the GPSIs in there. Tony uh, has got a very large experience of, of providing uh, surgery in the community uh, in Coventry and the Midlands. And he's been an advisor on many boards. And he's also an advisor to the GMC on medical legal issues when things go wrong and when things go right too. Indeed. Okay. So Tony is going to speak about uh, his experience in the community and what he sees as a future happening. I'm very happy to take any questions you might have in here, please. Thank you. Okay, thank you, VJ. Um, I can't see the ages of people in, in, in the audience very well, but hopefully you look as if they're fairly young, so perhaps hopefully looking towards the future, um, which is where I think um, a lot of surgery um, is going to be um, in the community. Um, I'm going to go through the slides fairly quickly because uh, I think the main thing is really for, for you to be asking us um, about our experiences and how, whether you're interested in, in surgery in the community and uh, how to get involved as well. Um, this is just me, as uh, Vijay has said. Um, I've been doing uh, vasectomies for many, many years. Um, I'm a clinical lead, um, but I also do a lot of uh, medico legal work. Um, in my own GP, I've basically been a GP, but uh, also done lots of just normal minor surgery, just uh, skin surgery, toenails, and things like that but I think there's uh, a lot more scope. Um, I can't remember, probably about 10, 15 years ago, um, those of us who do surgery in the community started um, an organization, uh, which initially started as something called VANCE, which was the British Association of Non-Scalpel Vasectomists, and just for vasectomists, but then a few years ago, we merged with the ASPC, Association of Surgeons uh, in Primary Care. Um, and that's who we're representing here this morning. Um, so what are the opportunities? I mean, we've all heard about the five-year forward plan um, and the opportunities for not just GPs, but also for um, uh, consultants and other surgeons still working in the, uh, in the hospital section. Um, when we talk about back to the future, of course, a lot of surgery used to be done in the community. Um, but we're not really talking about um, doing tonsillectomies on the kitchen table. Um, I don't think that's quite appropriate these days. Um, at the moment, there's a lot of examples of good primary care centers, a lot of new bills um, as regards um, the facilities. Um, and a lot of these have very good operating suites. Um, some of them sadly use perhaps once a week. So there's a huge wastage of um, uh, of uh, premises, um, and that's something which actually we hope can become more efficient. Um, in some areas of the country, there's always uh, already set up um, a lot of um, local, um, uh, a lot of surgery um, uh, under local anaesthetic, um, and uh, for example, in the north, which is where, where VJ works, and not just surgery, but also diagnostic centers. That's a very busy slide, I'm not going to go through it, but basically it just shows all, all the bits and pieces that actually get, um, are put into the health service um, and are part of the NHS um, and social care. Um, we're all meant to be working together. I'm not quite sure whether we do. 
Um, whether or not you like Andrew Lansley, I haven't heard a lot of good things of, said about what he's uh, tried to get through. But the important thing, you know, a couple of messages there, it's actually making decisions for the patients um, and the cl clinicians closer to home. And let's take more control and get more involved um, in how the, the services are being run and organized. The current structure is still very much going our own separate ways. We're working in silos. Um, and really, we need to be working much closer together. Um, and that's certainly one of the things that in ASBC was trying to do um, and actually work more closely with um, our, our consultant and hospital colleagues. Yes, don't throw too many darts at him. Um, he does have some good ideas. <laughs> We're not going to talk about contracts, um, but I think we have to accept that the current system um, in the NHS, it cannot last forever the way services are being commissioned. So why change? Um, it's basically to actually give our patients a much better service. Um, and at the same time, I think that makes a much better work environment for ourselves. We can actually improve efficiency, patient-centered services, and the opportunity is to eliminate some of the boundaries and develop new models of care and working together. Already have been some new models. Some of those have worked very well. One in particular not worked quite so well when you look at Circle and Hinch's book. But that doesn't mean to say we shouldn't be trying. Um, if you don't try, you don't know whether you're going to succeed or not. So what has been happening, there have been some Vanguard sites. Um, these all started um, a year or two ago, and lots of applications, 29 appointed. And these are basically where you've got multi-specialty community providers, um, where there's more joint working across primary uh, and secondary uh, systems, urgent care services, specialized care, um, and so on. And there was new money put into that. Clearly, it's going to take time to evaluate these but they look as if they're going well. What's our role in the ASPC? Well, as I said earlier, it's actually us actually getting together to be um, a body that can share ideas, peer review, and also getting very involved in, uh, in lobbying various departments, um, uh, uh, the Department of Health, and also various other bodies, um, which include um, the Royal Colleges, uh, and even today, uh, sorry, as from yesterday, we're starting, to, we're starting to look at the new guidelines that have actually was published um, a couple of weeks ago about how to do post vasectomy semen analysis. And there's probably about 20, 30 emails have already been gone backwards and forwards in the last 12 hours. So we are actively involved in actually ensuring there is evidence for the work that we're doing. Just a plug. If you're anywhere in the Warwickshire area, we do have our own conference in a couple of weeks' time. Um, and you can actually get details up from the net, our website there. Why are we doing it? Well, we've heard a lot about the pressure um, and the threats that we've all got. This isn't just GPs, but also um, uh, any hospital doctor, junior doctors, consultants. Um, the number of complaints that come through, which actually makes our work not always as good as it could be. So that's why certainly I've always felt that being what we call a portfolio GP is important. There's a lot of variety there. You're not doing the same thing day in, day out. Um, and I think by working closer together, um, so for, the, um, for um, consultants, hospital doctors to come into the community, that's giving you variety. Um, and also a much, um, uh, much more a different environment and a different patient experience than all the consultants that we actually have got our work in the community say how good it is and how different it is um, for themselves and obviously for the patients. Um, you might say, well, it's a manpower crisis. How can we actually do all this? But actually, if you work more efficiently, then actually you can actually um, do that. Um, but we do have to be careful. Um, to make sure we do have the people there. So it's not just GPs who work in the community, it's actually we're getting the uh, people like yourselves 
to come and work with us. But the figures actually are not very good at the moment. And also, we've got two and a, nearly two and a half billion pounds. Will it make a difference? Actually, a lot of that money is old money, um, and it's actually just replacing money that's been taken away. So what's in it? First of all, for GPs, um, newer premises, lifelong income from sites, new ways of working partnerships, um, clinics working together, um, wherever we have actually had GPs working more closely with consultants and hospital colleagues, there has been um, an exchange of learning, um, exchange of ideas, and both sides have always benefited. What's it for yourselves? Come and work, do sessions with, um, in the community, guaranteed income, different roles, opportunity to develop services, um, set working days, and free from hospital management burden. That must be a big, um, a big positive. But you might ask, is it safe? A lot of people ask, well, how can you make sure that things are safe? You haven't got all the equipment, the facilities, the people. Um, if you're operating, you're probably used to having lots of people in theatres. Um, we rarely have more than one when we're operating, because you don't need anybody else. Um, when we operate, we just have two or three instruments. We don't have a whole set all laid out. So it's much more efficient. But the standards of care must be at least as good. Outcomes must be as good. Patient satisfaction must be at least as good. And efficiency, cost effectiveness must also, of course, be considered. So, we've got the evidence. We do the audits. This was published a couple of weeks ago um, in conjunction with um, British Association of Dermatology and uh, the RCGP, Jonathan Botting. He's on our um, uh, council of the SPC, and he's published this. There's lots of figures, um, which I'll very quickly go through, but basically, it was a minor surgery it's basically just basically skin surgery, nail, toenail surgery, and the aim was to audit the performance of GP minor surgeons in different settings. Community based, um, and looked at the outcomes. And there were three different types of GPs those who worked in enhanced primary services, those with a special interest, and GPs, in a sense, just working on their own. Audit forms were completed um, and collected and over 6,000 procedures have been um, looked at. I'm not gonna go through all those, but basically, they are good. And it actually shows that GP surg minor surgery is safe, it's prompt, it people are working together in a managed framework are slightly better, so consideration needs to be given as to how better supported GPs can be, and that's where we look to yourselves to support us. Vasectomies, we've been collecting data for over eight years uh, through a standard questionnaire. We've got data on over 30,000 vasectomies on accurate data and probably 80,000 on retrospective data. We ordered about 7,000 a year and the data is presented annually at conferences and peer reviewed. Those are our figures. Early failure, about one in 300. Infection rates, between one and a half, two and a half percent. Hematomas, two and a half to four percent. We will not better those in the acute sector. Cost effective? We actually moan we don't get enough. Patient satisfaction? You can't get better than that. 98% experienced no problems, felt very comfortable. Premises excellent or very good, no pain, slightly painful. The man of the doctors is nearly 100%. 98% overall impression, it was very good. What else can we do? I don't, but there are people in the SBC who do. Carpal tunnel surgery, that's actually starting to gain more momentum. There are quite a few ophthalmology clinics around in the community. Um, hernia operations under local anaesthetic. Diagnostic procedures, endoscopies, whichever orifice you want to go into, 
And I would actually suggest and challenge you that anything that doesn't require a GA or expensive specialised equipment or personnel could be done in the community. More cost efficient, better for the patient, closer to home, more prompt, very rarely have waiting lists, and it's a better way of working. Thank you. DJ, Manu, <coughs> any, any Thank you additions? Much. Yeah, okay. Uh, I, I think, uh, I think t t Tony has presented uh, the facts of how the involvement has taken place from GPs who had some surgical training and then moved on to uh, um, you know, work in primary care. But I think the, the whole organization has evolved in such a way that our membership for uh, hospital consultants has greatly increased. I think there's been a considerable amount of frustration in the secondary care sector, constantly being cut. I think the power of, of the days when the Royal College sort of held sway, I think, has considerably decreased. Uh, we are the, uh, we've seen the junior doctor strike and happiness with the, with, with the way the situation is going. But I, th I think primary care uh, is a great opportunity for the future. And I think there's a big emphasis by the Secretary of State for Health, certainly in England, to push forth more and more procedures. I think the, the, the target is set at 71%. I think currently we're achieving about 60% of procedures to move into the community and community hospitals in there. And community hospitals are, uh, in the old days, used to be a little cottage hospital with a couple of wards attached. Very different now. I mean, if you go into some of the uh, multi-million GP centers, I, I call them GP centers, but they're actually a huge community surgical centers which actually have a GP surgery attached to them the other way around. Uh, I work in one which has got uh, 25 air change. You know, the, the air change alone costed just under a million pounds uh, to fit. And that's got a higher spec than the local hospital uh, day surgery unit. Uh, and there's a paper published by Anna Lip and myself uh, three, four days ago in the BJGP. It looks at uh, moving more work into the community, working closely with the day surgeons to move uh, into the community. So I'm very open to questions, please. Please, yeah, with the gentleman at the back, please, yes. Okay, I'll give you the, uh, the experience in West Yorkshire, which has been established. I moved out of secondary care about 12, 12, 10, 12 years ago. So they've been established since the late 90s. The JAG approved both the centers. Uh, those centers alone, I'm told, carry out approximately three centers, sorry, three, so one in Pontefract, one in South Emsill, and one just further uh, close to Wakefield, and possibly one further afield in Osset. Uh, they carry out 100% of the non-two weeks wait of procedures, except ASA 4 or 5 patients who have been referred on uh, by the GPs. To my understanding, I've spoken to the JAC accreditor for that area, who is a consultant, and they're all accredited. They have the same kit. Now, you asked about the decontamination. You're right. There has been issues with decontamination, I would say, about five, six years ago, and they had difficulties, and the kit had to be changed, etc. The cost was immensely going up. I have done endoscopies in the community in Warrington some years ago, and I'm aware of the problems. What they do is they use the, uh, the white van model. So what they do, the companies do, they have a central base where everything is sterilized, and in the morning of the endoscopy, this white van arrives with freshly uh, sort of uh, uh, sterilized uh, colonoscopes and uh, flexiscopes and, and gastroscopes. They're taken off, put in a rack, wheeled in into the suite, and the procedure is done, put back on the rack and taken away. So that's the way they get around it. The JAG looks at the accreditation of the quality of people are doing, and as Tony pointed out, and more and more consultants are actually working in the community. So you might have one or two GPSIs. Uh, you certainly have two or three consultants working. And as I said, a couple of friends of mine who do the procedures have actually dropped the sessions in secondary care. Because uh, again, uh, in, in, in a primary care setting, you would do something like about 18 to 20, or even 22 endoscopies in a day. You'll struggle to do that in the local secondary care sector because a multitude of reasons, um, you know, nurse off sick, coffee break, tea break, you know, your porters can't bring the patient, DNA rate is higher. Those are much less in primary care. Um, and in terms of patient satisfaction, it's absolutely fantastic. It's my 20, 27th year in the NHS, having worked in secondary care for many years, I think the patient satisfaction is fantastic and it saves a lot of money uh, for, 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 for the NHS as a whole. Tony, would you have any comments on no, that? I, th I think that's right. And then the, uh, certainly locally in commentary, you know, was, uh, there's a practice that does, uh, I think just basic sigmoidoscopies um, at the moment. Um, but there's no reason, you know, if you've got facilities for the decontamination, 
um, uh, then that's okay. As I say, the standards have to be equally as good, and, and quite often they're actually better, um, I would suggest. Yeah, in terms of uh, the decontamination, in, with skin surgery, we use uh, disposable instruments, so that's the way we go around that. Mm. Overall, I think it's the patient satisfaction. They're really happy with care closer to the home to come to a GP practice uh, uh, environment and have this done in a, in a proper facility. Uh, and it's more cost efficient. I think this, this stumbling block, because I'm not sure if you're a trainee or you're a consultant, uh, you're consultant, right? The main issue is training at the moment, and uh, the CCGs are trying to get past it by speaking to the local deaneries. Yorkshire has been pretty good. Uh, the deanery has been very supportive uh, of trying to get trainees into the centres. The issues around funding for it, the issues around uh, MDU, MPS, etc., uh, sort of uh, the cover that needs to be provided outside the Crown indemnity uh, in the GP centres because GPs pay uh, a different kind of indemnity to, to what the, uh, the, the hospital system pays. But they are trying to get around it. I'm aware of a very large vascular contract that's gone out to the community in there. And they have insisted that they should have surgical trainees working in the community in these uh, big community uh, general practice centers. But it's, it's getting around. It's getting there. Please, you had a question. Yep. Yes? Yep. Yes? Yep. You've seen a few. Four of them on the picture were from South Yorkshire. Yes. Okay. I, I think the, the experience there is that uh, a lot of the hospitals are actually very keen for um, a lot of this. I don't like the word minor surgery, but you know, um, local anaesthetic um, or more straightforward surgery to be moved out, so they can be left to deal with the more complex work, um, and. Uh, it's really a matter of just talking to the commissioners, um, uh, and we've all been on the, um, Vivage and myself, all been trying to convince the commissioners, we've been commissioners ourselves, but at the moment there is not enough staff in the commissioning units, the CCGs, to convince them to actually get this um, work underway. However, I'd also suggest there's no reason why the hospitals themselves um, shouldn't actually commission with community centres to be able to take them out, because that releases, um, uh, uh, releases the theatres, it releases the staff, um, and it helps with waiting lists, um, and everybody wins. Everybody wins. So I think it's, yes, talk to the commissioners uh, from the hospital doctor's point of view, go and talk to the commissioners saying, we think this, these services, these facilities, these operations, these procedures should be put into the community. How can we work together? And we'll support you. We've got a lot of information and um, and evidence to show that. Do you want to talk about the Liverpool area, how it works? Well, um, I do skin surgery in vasectomy, and as I said, um, um, we use disposable instruments um, and um, for, for both uh, skin surgery and vasectomy. It's uh, a great service. The patients are really, really very happy uh, because they're very local. Uh, so so they love centres, yeah. yeah. May I ask where you work in South Yorkshire? Barnsley, right, okay, okay. Some of your consultants actually work out in the community. Uh, in fact, uh, one of your colleagues that are naming him in the eye, eye clinic actually uh, runs uh, three centers in Leeds. Uh, he does ophthalmology, uh, he's a big fan. He's actually speaking uh, uh, on the ASPC conference uh, uh, on the 2021st, uh, running a workshop uh, on eye surgery. Um, yes, you have very large centers in Barnsley. I actually work one day a week out of Mexborough which is just up the road from yourself. Uh, and we have, um, we have nine, nine plus three. We have 12 consultants working in the community in Maxborough and in Asken, which is other side of the A1. Uh, so yes, there are contracts up there. Yes, there are very nice lift buildings, but it's really down to the CCG, which actually can push, it can't push, down to leadership. Uh, you talked to, talk to the ministers. I had a meeting uh, with the health minister about uh, six, seven weeks ago with a colleague of mine. And they, at the top, they're very keen to push uh, as much as procedures in the community. But when it comes down, three, four, five levels down, it doesn't happen to the CCG. Uh, Bansley is not one of the unreasonable CCGs around. There were CCGs around the country on, on a rate of one, one to ten. 
I don't think South Yorkshire probably stands out very much. Sheffield probably does, but there are not many cities stand out so much. And I think really down to local commissioners to move the work. Um, but I think I think I think Barnsley will improve. I dare say you have very good centres and town centres, and it's really up to the local commissioners to to commission service. Your sectomy is out in Barnsley. Your carpal tunnel is out, and I suspect your varicose veins work is also coming out in Barnsley. Is contract with Sheffield? Is it? So that's not been moved out to the community, right? Because I know they had two, three contracts out not so long ago. You can work on it, VJ. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, great, fantastic, yes. Okay, yeah, yeah. I work closely with Kapil Kapoor and uh, Mr. Hassan, so uh, yeah, very happy to do that. Yes, indeed, thank you. Eriko, please. <laughs> That's Tony's baby, yes. Uh, yes, I mean, I've been involved in training for a long time. Um, and to certain extent, I'm the training lead within the SPC for the sector meets. Um, I and mean, there's two aspects of the training. One is obviously people who have never done any before, and the second one is people who are still using what are called the, um, the old cut and tie technique who need to be updated. Um, uh, I do have people approach me who um, are fairly newly qualified GPs, says, oh, I want to learn to do vasectomies. So I ask, well, what training have you had? Oh, I did a one-day course on minor surgery. And I said, perhaps vasectomy isn't the right operation to start on. Um, so I tend to send them away. Now that actually makes life very difficult because GPs, especially coming out and uh, becoming GPs, have usually had very minimal, if any, direct hands-on experience of surgery, um, which is why actually we're now you know, needing to talk more to, to the hospital doctors to come and work in us, with us. But there are some who have actually started out life um, in surgery perhaps, uh, especially urology, and then they come in to become GPs and again, they are ideal because they have developed their surgical skills. You talk about funding, um, none, dare I say it. Um, uh, I think it's very difficult, uh, certainly for an individual, to get training for a specific procedure. Some, I know, have had some, training, uh, so, some funding from the CCGs when the CCG has commissioned the service through them. But generally speaking, they probably have to pay themselves which can cost anything between 500 and 2,000 pounds um, if you're starting from scratch. But if you look in the long term as to how quickly you can recoup that, it actually doesn't take very long as regards the profits that you can actually make. Um, but the whole question of training uh, in the community, BJ did actually uh, mention it, um, is still uh, quite a big, uh, difficult one because it's actually managed trying to get the deanery to transfer some of the training monies from the acute hospital sector into the community. Because um, if I train, I've got to um, probably reduce the number of patients that I'm operating on by half. And you've still got the same staff equipment, and so that cut, that's half your profits. So you have to recoup those. Um, the other way of doing it, um, I don't know if you've heard of uh, Dr. Spooner. She, she's, I don't think she um, no longer works within the NHS in country, but she travels abroad a lot and does vasectomy clinics in the Philippines and other countries, and she takes trainees with her and uh, trains them there, and the, the only cost is the cost of your travel. So that's another way. Yeah, I think that's been a very big success story. I think the last trip, she was down in the Philippines, and she had uh, got a few uh, sort of uh, Aussies and a few Brits and... Uh, <laughs> Some Americans had gone down and they had a very good opportunity to do numerous vasectomies down in the uh, in Philippines. And, and previously she went to Haiti, if I remember correctly, yeah, yeah. and she took uh, quite a large number of people. The training is available, as Tony says, but the question, you have to find it and fund it. She did a very large program down in north of Scotland. Um, with, yeah, yes, uh, with Duncan Nichols. With Duncan Nichols yeah, down in the Highlands, really. The, 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 the GPs have actually leased a hospital uh, and employed consultants to come and do a lot of procedure in the Highlands. And uh, Duncan Nichols leads on it. Uh, and... Uh, I do know Laurel Spooner and Soon Lim tend to go there and, and, and run training programs. And I think that is funded. I think, uh, I think NHS Scotland did actually provide funds for that. Uh, the Scottish, oh, yes. NHS Scotland provided funding yes. for uh, their trainees, which is great. Uh, but I think I have to be opened in England to, to do it in that way. Then. Uh, any other questions, please? To so, we'll, yeah.
Yes. Mm. Um, I mean, I could speak 30 minutes on the topic yeah. <laughs> both with happiness and frustration, but uh, to, to cut the, the long uh, answer short, really, uh, I think you're really down to local leadership and how people view it. Many of you might know uh, there's a super GP practices has come on board now. There's the largest one coming in Birmingham. Uh, sorry, Northampton, is it? A lakeside surgery. It's mm -hmm. about 180,000 patients, 180,000. You know, the old days when you had little GP centers with 3,000 patients, it's, it's, it's going, going, gone. Uh, and and, and uh, the new system is coming in, which means they have a lot of clout. Uh, you know, there are areas where hospitals have to shut down departments. In the, in Barnsley itself, I'm aware some of the urology has gone off to, to Sheffield, etc. I'm aware in the, the acute penine trust, the CCGs have the clout to shut departments, move departments across because of the funding issues in there. As Tony pointed out, the 2.4 billion ain't new money, is recycled money. So it's really down to leadership and how actually one actually works. I suspect at the top there is, there is a big interest and people want to move, but the NHS really doesn't give much time, particularly in England, to actually one program to settle before another program comes into place. We, there are thousands and thousands of redundancies. People with good skills have just disappeared completely. And, 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 and you have sort of young people in there who really don't understand the, the, the whole process. Uh, of how to take it forward. So I think sadly it's patchy. You've got excellent areas like, like uh, uh, sort of the, the areas around uh, Mid Yorkshire Trust, uh, where a lot of work has been found out of the community. Lincolnshire, which is another fantastic area. Uh, you've got excellent leadership there. She's coming and talking at the ASPC conference, the head of commissioning down there on quality to, to actually genuinely have working between consultants and GPs in the community in there. Uh, you have Cornwall, which is a great example, where uh, one of the large practices has leased three hospitals from the NHS to actually take on the work, a lot of max officially work, surgical work. Uh, um, Cornwall is the, is the base where uh, the ASPC founder, Raj Dumali, started. He published work on 3,000 hernias, which he carried out in the community. So there's a very good example of, of various areas of good work has taken place. So it is patchy, I'm sorry to say, but I think like everything else in the NHS, you know, there isn't given enough time for things to move. And invest millions of pounds on these projects. You're only given a three-year contract with the potential for a couple of years investments. So it's an AQP. If you don't make your money, you've lost. You've got to go to the bank, borrow money, and the GPs do take a risk to do it. But nevertheless, the process is slow, and I think the time needs to be given. But I think it's also for, um, you know, the, the hospital sector to actually realise actually this is beneficial to them and, uh, you know, the community as a whole, and to push to the commissioners themselves. So I think it, you know, I think it can be a two or three pronged attack, really. Um, but I, I think a lot, that, to be honest, I just don't think there are enough uh, managers in the CCG who appreciate the, the, the advantages and the benefits. Um, and, they're, and they're so tied up with doing other things. And they're just not in, you know, with the, because their management costs had to be cut down to, you know, in some cases by half. And so you haven't got the people because it does take a long time to work up uh, new contracts and how to commission them. Um, and so we, we you know, we just, we're just there as a resource as well. I mean, one thing is certain, uh, certainly over the 10, 12 years, is the number of hospital consultants who really feel very comfortable working with the GPs, the community has yeah. changed considerably. I mean, it used mm. to be a very much an ivory tower, certainly very sarcastic comments used to be passed on uh, GPs in the years gone by. Mm. Uh, but that's gone, I think, more mm. or less, you know, the chip on the shoulder is over. It's genuinely about working together uh, in the community. Mm. Uh, as I said, I mean, I, I started my training in the late 80s down in West Country, and West Country trained, and we did a lot of work uh, in the community at the time with the GPs. And uh, as Tony put it back to the future, the clock does go back all the way around. Uh, any other questions, please? Does anybody think that actually it's not a good idea? Or what are the, what are the challenges or, or, or what are any reasons why it shouldn't happen? Okay. Um, what would you say to uh, what Doncaster is currently doing, farming out a lot of his work <clears throat> because they're breaching their 18 weeks wait, they're, they're struggling, they're being penalised. As you know, the uh, Director of Finance has gone AWOL in Doncaster, acute trust with 35 million hole in there. 
uh, and uh, you know, PricewaterhouseCoopers, I think, are one of the big accounting firms have been called in to look at the finances and the big hole in the, in the thing. That you know, it, it's I think is a win-win for trust because the cost is lower, is better, uh, and I think. And I think patient power counts these days. Patient power counts, like it or not. Yes. Yes. But but. It but what you could also do, you could subcontract. As we've already heard that some NHS trusts subcontract their a particular procedure to somewhere else. Cornwall. So, vasectomy yeah. is, you're getting £600 for it, you pay me £300, i will do it. Okay, you're, you know, you're um, helping your waiting list, you're making profit, I'm getting a bit more. Who's losing? Nobody. So, which is why I think, you know, the hospitals need to actually start to look at things uh, more laterally as well. I think another important thing is you have very big players in the field. You've got Care UK yesterday in the papers, huge contracts, 40 million, 60 million. You've got Virgin, which is a very big player. Um, but I think large organisations don't do well. I think, I think um, the local secondary care trust working with the local CCG and the GPs works better. It's very mm. local. The money yes. is kept within the local health economy. It doesn't get sent off to British Virgin Islands or somewhere else. <clears throat> That's where Virgin Health is actually registered, I understand in there and I think there's better governance working with the local consultants rather than you know disrespect to Hungarian or, or, or Prague consultants but it's nice to have local consultants where they can pick up a problem if things happen I think that's that's the way forward uh, of, of working uh, locally in, in the local health economy and working to keep the money within that area is what, what I think is great please Okay, uh, I understand. I have only read in the, in, the, in the press, as it were, recently that I believe the GPs in Northern Ireland had formed a federation, which I thought was very impressive because very often uh, the GPs tend to be treated as uh, the poor cousins of the, of the English ones. Very often that's the image we're given in the, in the, in the, in the medical um, comics, as it were, really. Uh, but it's a very impressive the fact they actually have federation, which means that they have more, more clout, political clout, uh, and more push to, 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 to actually do more procedures. Um, I'm aware of the crisis in Northern Ireland uh, with, with, with uh, GPs struggling to recruit, but I think, I think GPs are good here. I think there are, the Federation will bring forth uh, opportunity to lease hospitals. It's about changing the mindset. It's about changing the mindset. Um, I'll give an example. About 10 years ago, a very entrepreneurial um, English ophthalmology surgeon used to fly Northern Ireland, patient, Northern Ireland patients with EasyJet to Newcastle the part of the hospital, the theatres, were actually leased to him. And these patients used to be operated in Newcastle. And they used to be flown back from Newcastle back to Belfast in there. I certainly did it about eight, nine years ago. He did that about two to three years because the waiting list was so huge in Northern Ireland. So I think it's, it's, to, it's to talk to the right people and say, look, here's a model. ASPC has been doing it. There are numerous centres around England that's taken place. This is very cost effective. Patients will walk to the feet. And politicians will, you, most of them will listen. Whether they'll do something about it is a different story. They're very canny about things. But certainly, I think, I th I think there's a push to cut costs. There's a push to increase standards. There's a push on, on, on patient power. And I think the way you would go forward is, is have a look at our website, look at the various procedures we classify, one, two, three, four, uh, look at the, the searches you could do and say, look, we have the skills. We have the necessary uh, sort of manpower to do it. And would you be interested in uh, for us to do this procedure? So I think the tiddly widdly skin stuff that used to be done still continues in many parts of the country. But you're looking at what you call as level two. Tony hadn't got the slides in there, but if you look on our website, you'll see level two, level threes. Uh, and you could start out with carpal tunnel if you have the right skills to do it and the accreditation to do it and the right insurance to do it. But somebody has to pay, and the commissioners in Northern Ireland will have to fund it in there. I think the other thing you need to think about is um, 
I don't know how good you know the standard of premises is generally in Northern Ireland, uh, but, but certainly in England, uh, uh, some are very poor, um, and some money is coming through to, for new premises to be built. Um, so if you get a number of practices that actually group together for new premises um, with funding for that, then you can actually have a very good um, suite there for operating on. You don't, um, for a lot of these, you don't actually have to have these 12 or whatever air exchange. exchanges. Um, I've been working out of, used to be uh, the front room of a Victorian house. In fact, I still do. Um, you know, and the ventilation is if it's hot, you open the window. Um, you have to have a fly screen. I've never seen a fly come in yet anyway. Uh, and these are acceptable premises um, for straightforward skin surgery, carpal tunnel, and um, vasectomies. When you get into things like hernias, then yes, you do start to need the air exchanges. But the cost of these things are not near the million pounds that VJ mentioned earlier. They're in the tens of thousands now um, are very, very now affordable. There is so a you need to be working together. Yeah, there, is, there is a paper which ASPC did some years ago looking at what standards are needed with the British Association of Pathologists yeah. uh, and infection control. Yes. Uh, it's out there and actually tells you what can be done where. Actually, be surprised, contrary to proper belief, you don't need very expensive specking yeah. for the procedures you do. It's yeah. not that complex. And, and to be fair, if you look at the literature again, the infection control in Britain is fantastic. It's absolutely fantastic. Uh, compared to Australian figures, uh, I can certainly, if you look at the, the primary care, uh, we're about a third, it's only a third of the infection uh, rates what you actually see in Australia and New Zealand, which is quite, which is quite surprising. I think we're good. Very often we need to, we forget, we need to pat ourselves on the back and say, hey, we're doing well in this country. Please. <clears throat> are, are you saying that the trainers are going to lose out? Are you saying that... Uh, yes. Yes, I mean, as I, as I was talking last night, I was saying that there are areas in the country where you could have a consultant orthopedic surgeon who hasn't done any carpal tunnel for two to three years because his part of the rotation happens to be in West Yorkshire. In Leeds rotation, you're there. You probably will struggle to find carpal tunnel surgery on your list. Cataracts, again, are done in the community. And again, if you're a trainee wanting to do a, a bread and butter cataract, it's very hard to get training in cataracts because they're all done in the community. And I think there's been a very big push, certainly by the chair of the CCG in West Yorkshire, to talk to the deaneries to include the training. Varicus Wayne surgery now, if you look at it, it's been pushed in the community. You know, as an SHO, I used to do left, right, and center, two, three legs in the morning. You can't get that now. SHOs don't get in training. Registrars are struggling now. But there is a push. The main issue, really, is funding streams. When you do them in the primary mm -hmm. care, it's cheaper. Uh, the patients go to the feet, and the commissioners seem happy. But, but something you, you could speak with the deanery and say, guys, why don't we get our trainees into the community? And there is a push. It'll happen. It'll happen. Manu, any experience of that? Mm -hmm. right. No? No, I mean, this was, a, this was um, a question earlier on about, you know, is there any funding? Um, and it is a big concern. I agree with you. Um, and I think it's a matter of the, of the junior doctors actually talking to the deanery and saying, look, we want this experience. It is, we can now get it in the community. Um, how can we actually get that sorted and look at how the training programs are run? Um, you know, we, we can push, but I think it needs, for the, it needs to be uh, people like yourselves need to be pushing as well. Do you see it happening in Northern Ireland? Do you see any obstacles as such? Is there anything ASPC can help? Those are the ideal premises. You know, you've got them already, haven't you? Yeah, absolutely. Right.
Right. Yes. You you could take a leaf out of the the book in, in in England, really. I mean, some years ago, the GPs in Surrey went and bought out the local DGH completely. They took over the local DGH. That's one of the uh, I can't remember where in Surrey, but it's down around the M25. They joined up together on the purchase of local DGH, <clears throat> which was off for sale at the time. It is one of the trials when the last years of Tony Blair and Mr. Brown's years at the time, uh, and, and they ran a service from there. So that's one way of doing things where the GPs take over and then work with the consultants. Another way, which is again has been popular, is the what they call as a consultant chamber. So there's nothing stopping a group of consultant, like-minded consultants working together and say, you know what, we're going to offer our services. <clears throat> if you work X number of PAs at the hospital, we want to offer our service to X number of PAs in the community. And you would work the GP to obtain the contract, put a bid through, get the contract contract and lease the particular building to do the work. I'm aware across the border in, in Republic of Ireland there is a push to do in Donegal, there's a push to do that in Navin, there's also a push to do that in Dublin. Uh, it's interesting because they are a sister organization uh, with ASPC um, and they are pushing to get consultants to come and work. I know certainly a plastic surgeon is hoping to come and do some work, but their healthcare system is different to ours with their private, uh, private NHS divide. Um, so, but they are pushing forward, so it'll happen. The question is how much, how much forward thinking is there for the commissioners? But it's like everything else. Um, some people think ignorance is bliss and probably need to wake them up and say, come on, guys, let's do something, something different. We can do it. Please. Okay, Tony, can um, start with that one? Yes, I mean, that's, uh, that's how I learned. I've, um, you may not uh, recall or know about the old days of what we call GP fund holding, but that's when I started to consider doing additional procedures, um, and I got interested in, I thought, oh, I can do vasectomies. So I went and uh, had a word with a local consultant, went into their day unit, um, for a number of sessions until he felt I was proficient and then brought it back into my own. Um, I think that's, that will, uh, I think it's a good way of learning, yes. Um, it needs good cooperation. You need to have a friendly consultant who's prepared to train you. I, I don't know what the rules are now within the hospital system um, regarding um, uh, uh, medical insurance liability. Um, I think that's a big issue and it certainly is, um, is potentially an issue for um, hospital trainees coming to the community as well um, as regards you know where the medical liability lies um, but I think these are things that c can be sorted but it is another, another way of actually uh, uh, of getting additional training for a particular procedure yes Okay, um, just a slightly different answer to Tony, just to, just, to, just to give you the picture on that. I can certainly speak for Yorkshire. We have a major problem and crisis in recruiting for GPs. We've got about 163 uh, GP race trap mm, posts vacant right. at the moment. Mm. They're not able to fill at the deanery in Leeds. And what we have tried is to speak to the various trusts where they have difficulties in getting, um, you know, what they call the trust doctor, etc., and see if those posts could be converted to GP training posts. So what we have been in, in talking both in South Yorkshire and in West Yorkshire uh, to see where, whether uh, some of the trainees who may wish to do surgical training uh, six months or a year, because uh, over the years I've seen, I, I've, I've worked from an SHA house officer to a consultant, I did breast colorectal work, and I can see the amount of less and less cutting happening over the years. Uh, with various trainees now than perhaps uh, what used to be in the past. Uh, and I think that the, the, the deanery in Leeds is certainly pushing to say, 
guys, do you want a choice? You know, do you want to spend a year, out, uh, uh, six months in a, in a surgical unit? Or do you want to do ENT? Do you want to do a, a bit of urology? Mm -hmm. So there is opportunity being looked at. There's also something called as VAT, which is value added training, which Lincolnshire pioneered, a chap called uh, Mike Pringle, who was the previous president of the, of the RCGP. And Mike at the time uh, got additional funding on his 100,000 pounds, a trainee. And going back to early 2000 to actually spend time, I know many people who actually worked in endoscopy units for a full year, done the full record of endoscopy training and continue to work in those units uh, because they didn't have them in primary care in the early 2000s. So there are opportunities, yes, but I don't know whether it's globally around the UK, but certainly it's there, the opportunity is there uh, for GP trainees to do that. Uh, in Leeds and, and vice versa we have where a lot of surgical training very often I get calls um, uh, wanting to speak you know surgeons who wanted to speak to me either consultants or, uh, uh, or, or surgical registrars who want to leave the training program and come in the community and see what opportunities exist so very often we have a chat on, uh, on those issues and again commissioning doesn't it's not terribly prescriptive in all parts of the country uh, for example um, you know, you have to forgive the fact that many of these, these so-called commissioners are not exactly consultant surgeons or professors or, or people who sit at that level. They are uh, essentially uh, people who got a business degree, usually work with a GP who's got some experience working in the community, and, and they actually put out the tender for the services. Uh, and, and they're not that prescriptive, but some of them are very prescriptive. You've got to have a consultant. You've got to have somebody who works at the, the local hospital. You've got to have somebody who's on the specialist register. Others say you need an FRCS, and you could do, which I think is not exactly right. I don't think just because you've got an FRCS makes you uh, a, a sort of a consultant who can actually do the procedure. So, so it's very variable, but that, to, the short answer to the question is, yes, there is opportunity, but whether it's globally around the UK, I don't know. Any other questions, please? If not, we'll uh, seal up the session. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you.